Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. Hello and welcome to Invest Africa. I'm Nozi Pombanjo. Now with 200 million people aged between 15 and 24, Africa maintains the youngest population in the world. The current trend indicates that this population will double by 2050. Africa's workforce is also becoming larger and better educated and this is indicating that there's an overwhelming potential for economic growth and development. Now as investors across Africa seek to diversify their portfolios, should they be looking at young people for high growth opportunities? To help me answer this question and to explore the investment case for Africa's youth, I'm joined by Robi Martinez. She's a senior manager at Dalberg Global Development Advisors. She is also a fellow of the Young African Leadership Initiative. I'm also joined by Mabutu Mtembu. He's the founder and chairman of the Youth Managers Foundation. And we're joined by Gandhi Bai. She's a director at the Sandy Zinia Foundation. Thank you so much uh, for making the time to join us. And of course, this is a significant time in South Africa. It is the beginning of an important month, uh, Youth Month in, in essence. Gandhi, let me first just start off with you to get a context of what the Sandy Zinia, uh, Zinia Bai Foundation actually does. What is your core focus? and what is the scope of your work? Um, well, the, at the Sandy Zinia Bio Foundation, our focus is uh, literacy, um, focusing on building libraries in the rural areas because we know that not everyone has access to the internet and um, e-books. Um, our second focus is on um, research, mm. uh, researching our African culture and history. The project that we're actually working on right now in partnership with the National Heritage Council is the story of the sinking of SS Mendi, 1917, where South Africans died in the ship and the story was never documented or, or celebrated or told. Mm. Um, we also focus on sports, teaching discipline through sports, mentorship and um, counseling. Now I love this phrase that comes with uh, the outlining of your objectives which is to proclaim African eminence. Let's yes. put that into English. What does that Proclaiming mean? Proclaiming African eminence is uh, basically standing on the rooftop and shouting and letting everyone know that Africans are excellent. Mm. We are an excellent continent. We are an excellent people and I think that we need to speak more about that. Mm. That's fantastic, and we'll come back to some of the work that you do. Uh, Mabuto, the Youth Managers Foundation, what is the, the focus and the scope of your work? Youth Managers Foundation is in partnership with high schools uh, from the so-called disadvantaged backgrounds uh, across the country. We currently operate in two provinces. Uh, our focus, uh, we've got three focus uh, areas, that is leadership development, mentorship, and career guidance. Uh, basically, with leadership development, we are developing young change-driven leaders right. uh, premised on seven leadership and selfless leadership who undertake uh, leadership responsibility to address the social ills that are negatively impacting them at their schools. Secondly, from a mentorship perspective, we have noted that young people from these areas that we target have a lot of potential, uh, but obviously there needs to be a platform for them to be yeah. able to you know, unleash that potential and that potential to be channeled to the right path. So from a mentorship perspective, we are providing guidance, we are providing direction and so forth to young so people. So you're investing in, in young people we're as investing in, young in people. one way or the other. Robi, I, I know that you're not the spokesperson for uh, the YALI program, but you're a fellow. You've just uh, completed your 12-month fellowship. What do you think uh, programs like YALI are doing when it comes to investing in young people? What is this actual investment that's coming out? I think programs like Kiali are looking at the broader youth space and seeing that our youth in Africa today have different needs and one of them is leadership and that we have to invest in that leadership potential for us to actually move the needle forward. So with, in this particular case, when we look at YALI, YALI is about identifying value-based leaders and taking them through a 12-month program of mm. training and at the end committing them to deliver a high-impact project. And I think to me, um, that last part is the most important right. piece. It's not just about training, but you have to ensure that post 
program implementation, if the leaders that you are developing are actually demonstrating what they've gained yeah. and are going back into their societies to do something. So clearly everybody around the table is involved in an initiative that is, a, that is investing in young people. But if we look at the demographics, for example, we see that the growth of the population is putting Africa at a very interesting point where uh, this demographic growth could actually be a dividend or as many have phrased it, a time bomb. Which way do you see it? Mabuto, what's your view on this? Look, uh, one would wish that it's a, it's a, it, it translates into a dividend. Yeah. But I think as it stands at the moment, yes, we are definitely sitting on a time bomb. And the reason being recently, I mean, the Statistician General in South Africa released some alarming results relating to young people, which he just summed up as a cocktail of disaster, where he said young people are hungry, they are uneducated, and they are unemployed. So basically what it means is that if you don't translate your young people into human capital yeah. that can contribute meaningfully in growing the economy of the country, therefore you are sitting on a time bomb because most of the young people are unemployable, they are sitting in the street, they are involved in drugs and so forth. Certainly there is a problem and I don't think we have been able to mm. solve it because what he further said is that the black and the colored Popula young population has actually regressed in terms of skills and education. So, so the since trend you're picking up is that one is one of regression and one where initiatives that are investing aren't able to actually move the dial as yet. Gandhi, you have experience that transcends uh, South Africa. More interestingly, you also a player in the Nigerian market, which is also very interesting. Would you share that sentiment that we're slowly moving backwards in terms of instead of moving forward, and what we are sitting on is a time bomb? I, I absolutely. I absolutely agree. I think that um, governments need to focus, for it to become a dividend, they need to focus on empowering the youth, empowering women, empowering the girl child in areas of um, health, education and skills. Um, as it stands now, the youth are unemployed, they're restless. That's how you get um, Boko Haram in Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, they're using the young people, the youth, you know. Um, corrupt politicians are using the young people to fight their battles. In Burundi 2015, there were protests. And it's young people that you see on the streets. In Libya 2011, it was young people. You know, Muhammad, um, Gaddafi died. He was murdered in 2012. They put in a new government. And still there's unrest. And instead, what's happening, our youth is is risking their lives, trying to cross the Mediterranean and drowning. And the world just sits and watches and calls them migrants instead of calling them refugees as they are because they're seeking for refuge. And it is a time bomb and we need to do something about it. So is the, is the answer employment, Robbie, or are we being a bit linear in, an, in our understanding of the crisis that we're seeing around the young population in Africa? So I think I'll and I agree with my, uh, my fellow panelists, but I'll, I'll probably want to sprinkle in a little bit of optimism there. Um, and that is to say, I think the chips are still in our hand. Uh, whether this becomes a demographic dividend or it becomes a time bomb, we still have room to actually play with this. And I, as, as you mentioned earlier, I work for Dalbeg, we do a lot of work in this space. And you are seeing a consciousness across the continent. Just this May, the African Development Bank, for example, launched a five billion 10-year strategy that, is about, that aims to actually generate about 25 million jobs. And there's a lot of activity that we are actually involved in and I personally have been involved in. So in one hand, I actually would argue that um, yes, the chips are still in our hand. There's something that we can do. Part of it, yes, is addressing the employment problem. I don't think we can run away from it. We've got to create opportunities. We've got to make sure that the young people have the skills to actually take advantage of those opportunities. And then broadly speaking, as my, pan my fellow panelists have mentioned, we've got to think about the context. Political stability is actually very important for us to ensure that young people can get there. The one thing I would actually perhaps uh, offer a critic on is the fact that I don't think the pace of activity mm -hmm. it matches the actual problem. Right. I think we're still a little bit behind, right? So you know the statistics, every year about 11 uh, million youth enter the job market, but there's only about 3 million job opportunities that are actually registered. So there is a bit of a gap. We're doing something, but I think we're a bit behind. We need to pick up pace. Mm -hmm. We need to scale up the good ideas if we're really going to get the demographic dividend. Yeah. In, in my view, Nozip, I think where we have lost it is that we have certainly uh, taken a position where we're trying to build a house without a foundation. Right. And what I mean is that back in 2009, the African leaders met in Addis Ababa uh, to try and defuse this un youth unemployment uh, time bomb. 
And part of what they agreed to implement in their respective countries was the youth programs like the National Youth Service, uh, you know, the TVET colleges, you know, training and, 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 and technical vo vocation that has been uh, sort of implemented in South Africa and the other enterprise development uh, initiatives that mm. are aimed at supporting entrepreneurs. But my view is that you are building a house, but you have forgotten about the, 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 fu the fundamentals, so which what is, the is the foundation. And the foundation is education. Now, we have, if you look at this country, for instance, we have not focused on the quality of education. We are focusing on the numbers, on the output, right. but we are not focusing on the quality of the output. Now, there are basic skills that you need to build at that foundation, numeracy skills, literacy skills, and so forth. I mean, you know, creativity mm. skills, uh, critical thinking, analytical skills, and so forth. You are not building those skills at that phase. Now, out of uh, uh, 1.5 million young people that enter grade R, about half of those people don't mm. finish, um, don't finish uh, grade uh, 12. Uh, you look at people that go to university, 70% of them don't finish their undergrad uh, degrees. Certainly there is a problem there. So you can't offer these programs without really having a solid foundation and highly, highly qualitative education that will enable mm. people to be the human capital that you need to grow the economy. Gandhi, Gandhi I, would, I would make the assumption that you would agree uh, with that analysis that Mabuto has put forward, especially when it comes to the, the low numeracy and literacy rates that we're seeing uh, in Africa. But maybe let's turn our focus a little bit to entrepreneurship because everybody is talking about entrepreneurship as uh, the key to unlock all of Africa's uh, problems and in particular around young people. But what is your experience of uh, the, the degree to which entrepreneurship has been able to respond to the pending crisis that we're seeing in the space? Um, <coughs> I, I agree with some points that he, he's made and um, I think governments are trying their best to support um, entrepreneurship programs. Um, for instance, in Nigeria, there was a program called You Win, where um, you would submit a business plan. The business plan would be sent to Lagos Business School for, for it to be analyzed. And if, if, there's, um, if it's approved, they give you the money for you to start the business. The only problem with that is that it was more like a grant instead of a loan. So the, you didn't have to pay back the loan and there was no measures to check and monitor if the mm. business was a success or a failure. It, reached, it didn't reach the grassroots because people on the, on, on the grassroots do not know how, some of them don't know how to write a business plan. So you're, you're telling them to submit business plans, they don't even know how to start it to write a business plan. So where are those steps? How do you train them? Mm to become entrepreneurs. So it and comes it goes back, back to, to numeracy and literacy. Exactly. So that is the focal point of the issue. Let's take a short break uh, on that note. But when we come back, we pick up the conversation looking at whether Africa's growing youth population is sitting as a time bomb or is there potential that this could be a demographic dividend? We'll see you in two minutes. Welcome back to Invest Africa. If you've just joined us, we're taking a look at Africa's growing youth population and we're really trying to dissect whether this is a ticking time bomb or could there be a demographic dividend? And helping me to answer this, this question is Robin Martinez. She's a senior manager uh, at Dalva Global Development Advisors. We're also joined uh, by Gandhi Bai. She's a director at the Sandy Zinia Foundation. And Mabutum Tembu, who is the founder and the chairman of Youth Ma Managers Foundation. For you at home, if you'd like to be a part of this conversation, all you need to do is tweet us. The hashtag is InvestAfrica. And of course, you can follow me at The Real Nozi or at CNB. Africa. Now, when we went to break, we were talking about entrepreneurship and whether the environment is fertile for young people to use this as an alternative to getting uh, traditional employment. Uh, your views on this, Robbie? I mean, I'm hearing from Gandhi is that uh, we still have numeracy and literacy as an issue for entrepreneurs who aren't able to make the most of the opportunities that are given to them. What has been the view from a Dalberg and a Robbie point of view? Okay. okay. So two, two points, uh, to go back to the question of education, um, and I completely agree that we need to interrogate the quality of our education, but I'll add one thing that I think a lot of times we think about education in terms of hard skills. We're training people to be experts in particular subject mm. areas and to enter the workforce in a similar, mm. similar manner. Uh, we are now starting to see that actually employers are looking for other skills, soft skills, analytical thinking, etc. So I think when we talk about the quality of education, we also have 
to think about skills that are relevant for 2016, skills right. that are relevant for you today and for the kind of job opportunities that are there. On the question of entrepreneurship, uh, I often joke about this and I say that we have development trends and when they come, we're all excited about them. And I think uh, this idea that everybody can be an entrepreneur yeah. is definitely a development trend. I don't think it's true. Not everybody can be an entrepreneur. Some can be, some cannot be. And I think while there's a lot of investment and interest going into, into entrepreneurship programs, we've got to think a bit more carefully. We've got to think about who we are selecting. Uh, we've got to understand the characteristics of the type of person who can actually succeed as an entrepreneur. We've got to understand the type of businesses that can actually scale up. We find that a lot of businesses are actually survivalist, right? Mm. They're mm. there to just provide for today and tomorrow. And a lot of them perhaps don't have the capacity or even the interest to expand beyond that. So you also have to identify the right kind of business. And then I can't emphasize enough, as uh, Gandhi was saying, the right kind of support. Right. You've got to help an entrepreneur get to their goals. You just don't give them money and walk away. So suppose suppose we get the, the full train process right in terms of choosing the right kind of businesses, selecting entrepreneurs who, who have the ability to become entrepreneurs, and we give them the support. Mabuto, what about the regulatory environment? If you look at South Africa, just the labor relations policy makes it so difficult for small and medium-sized players to hire and fire in a way that supports the growth of the business. So how do we revisit the way we think about labor relations so it actually supports entrepreneurship as against uh, contributing to its survivalist nature, if anything else? Yeah. It's a very thin line, uh, Nozipa, especially looking at the history of our country. Uh, there was a drastic change in our you know, labor laws as mm. a result of the fact that in the past, uh, you know, they catered for a certain group of people and yeah. a certain group of people were exploited and so forth. So you would expect such drastic changes to happen. And unfortunately, that has adverse impact, obviously, on the growth of business, on the employers to be able, you know, to employ more people, to be able to have that flexibility uh, to, to negotiate certain uh, level of wages and, and so forth. So I think what needs to happen is that that conversation needs to be had in this country because the unemployment rate is definitely going up. Uh, there's a lot of people that still need to be absorbed into the system. The employers are very reluctant to absorb them into the system because of these challenges that they are faced with from a labor law uh, perspective. Mm. So it's a conversation I think that needs to mm. be opened up. And I fully agree with you. If we were to make them a bit inflexible, uh, we would certainly achieve great things from an employment perspective right. and also in terms of supporting small businesses to be able to employ mm. people not at an exorbitant cost but be able to drive the growth of the business mm. as opposed to investing more in terms of uh, people uh, retention and so forth. I, I wonder if what we're seeing uh, is a South African phenomenon. For example, the strength of the unions has been a very important part of the history yeah. of the country and that's why the labor uh, regime is so rigid. Yeah. I'm very interested in understanding what happens in other African markets. What is the experience of Tanzania, Nigeria, um, uh, Gandhi? Do we find the same stringency, if, I'm, um, if I may use that phrase, when it comes to labor relations? Is it hard? Is, is it as hard in Nigeria to hire and fire as it is here in South Africa? Um, I uh, know it's, it's much easier in Nigeria to hire and fire. Um, rights for workers in Nigeria is something that really needs to be looked into by the government and developed. I mean, um, Nigeria is basically they only starting now to fight for a basic wage. So it's the other end of the spectrum. It's the other where end, of the the end spectrum. Of where the, the rights of the workers are actually uh, the ones that need attention. The Tanzanian uh, experience? Um, not as, as acute as South Africa, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, I think that uh, we, it's not as stringent. Um, to some extent, it's also a bit similar to what we're hearing from Nigeria in that we need to get better at implementing and protecting worker rights, etc. But I wouldn't say that it is the biggest problem, mm. especially when we're talking about youth and Because my, my, my follow-up question would have been, that has it made it easier for young people then? to start yes, small absolutely. businesses and to expand, which of course is the big, uh, the big conversation. It's not just starting, it's about expanding beyond the one or two initial founders of the business. Um, I wouldn't say yes, because I think you have to sort of step back and think about the broader ecosystem. Yeah. Because to me, labor laws are 
one one portion of that bigger story, mm. right? So if we think about the simple equation of employment, really, whether it is self-employment or, uh, or you know getting a job, you've got on one hand the opportunity, on the other hand you've got skills, right? And then in between there's a bit of a matching process mm. there. And then there's a, there are a lot of factors that actually play in there. So labor policy is one. It could influence how the opportunities are made available, when and to who. It could also influence the matching process. But as we've mentioned, education policy is a big right. thing, right? Um, economic policy, there, there are a lot of things. So when I think about a country like Tanzania, I would say you know, one of our major headaches is, look, we are, we are, we are registering 7% growth. But are we seeing that in jobs? Yeah. Right. Are we do we do, are we getting our education system right? And I'd say that's actually a lot more critical. Plus all the other processes that come into play right. more than just labor laws. So earlier, um, Gandhi, you made mention of the fact that, of course, uh, young people who are idle sit as an ideal opportunity to be uh, roped into movements like uh, Boko Haram. And it, it raises the question of what are the big social issues that we're expecting or that we are seeing young people support and stand behind? And what does this tell us about what young people actually care about? From where you stand, what do you think are the burning platforms of the burning issues that young people in South Africa, in Nigeria, on the continent broadly are saying, these are the issues of our generation and this is what we're going to fight for? Um, in my opinion, young people are fighting for the basics. They're fighting for their human rights. They're fighting for food on the table, mm. a roof over their head, education. Um, these are things that, have, that we, we don't have access to as a youth in, uh, um, on the continent. And I, it always, for me, it goes back to education and training and setting up centers um, where people can become plumbers or electricians yeah. or um, artisans, you right. know, and just to develop that and empower them with these skills so that they are able to empower themselves. So it's the basics uh, that allows them to have um, active economic mm -hmm. livelihoods. But you made a mention of a long list of interventions, Mabuto, and most of them, which I must say, haven't worked. What happened to the National Youth Service? Uh, the TVET colleges aren't really uh, doing well. So in your view, what should the burning issues be? Because we are seeing interventions coming to the fore mm -hmm. to try and give young people economic mm -hmm. livelihoods mm -hmm. and the skills to participate, but it's not quite clear where the gap is. So what should we be fighting for? Look, uh, Nozib, I think one of the, uh, the biggest mistakes that we have committed in this country is that we have set the bar very low from an education perspective for our youth. For instance, nowadays you just need 30% to pass uh, in, in high school to pass a subject and move to the next grade. Now on the subject of entrepreneurship, and that touches directly yeah. to the programs that we're talking about. Now, if you look at it, for me there are three critical areas. Firstly, if you are moving, for instance, Africa is moving from a resource-based economy to a more knowledge-based economy, and that's where entrepreneurs can thrive. One, they have to create, they have to invent, they have to innovate. Now, if your quality of education is not the greatest, how do you expect people to do that? That's one. Two is that access to the value chain in South Africa is very difficult. We know the value chain was controlled or is still controlled by a very select few individuals. Mm. Now, for entrepreneurs to gain access to that, it's also one of the major challenges. But to answer your questions, uh, what, where we have lost it, we have lost it at the foundation phase, like I was saying. Right. And that's where we need to fix it first. We need to start diverting our attention from the, from the numbers that we produce out of the system to the quality that we produce out of the system. Should we then be changing the metric? Because I think the fundamental issues that we judge success or failure based on the output number. Should we not be thinking about that as the metric to measure and maybe rethink the metric that we're using to judge the success or failure of uh, an entire system? Certainly, certainly. I mean, you spoke earlier in your introduction about uh, you know, the corporate sector, the type of employees that they are looking for. Now, if you're not going to have highly productive individuals, if you're not going to have individuals who are critical thinkers, if you're not going to have individuals who are going to come to your business and innovate and identify other business opportunities, then it means there are skills that you have not inculcated at a very young age. So 
when you then introduce them even to TVET colleges, I mean, what impact is it going to have if you have not laid the ground on these very critical I'm struggling, schools? Robbie, because I'm finding that I the gist of our conversation, we're still identifying the issues of the past as the main reason why we are here today. I'm particularly interested in understanding what should we be fighting for from here on if we're going to be rectifying uh, or making sure that this potential time bomb actually turns into a dividend. What are the burning issues we should be aligning behind? Um, I mean, we can't run away from education. So yeah. I think that we all agree is an important one. I do think that we need to think also about the other side of the equation, and that is what kind of opportunities are we creating, right? Mm. Um, it's one, I, I will repeat again, it's one thing to celebrate growth. It's another thing to really interrogate what kind of growth are we registering on the continent. Uh, which industries are growing? Are they the kind of industries that are creating a lot of jobs or a lot of quality jobs? What does that, how does that bear for the future? And I would say to me, you, we, we can't divorce the link between the opportunity and the skills that you're trying to develop. Mm. We could do a lot and change our education system, but if we don't think about what the economy is demanding, right. how those skills then plug into the economy to get us somewhere, we are still also missing the picture. So you've got to push both sides of that equation to me. Um, what, what do we need to do, right? You know, it's, it's a bit hard because I think there are a lot of ideas, a lot of people experimenting. Some are failing, some are succeeding. I like to think of it as a marketplace. The bad ones will die, the, the good ones will survive, and we need to figure a way to replicate. Mm. And as Africans, we really need to get better at implementation. I think we struggle. Sometimes we've got good ideas on paper, but when it comes to implementation, we've got serious problems, be it political will, funding, or just the skills to implement. So we've, we've got to get better at that as well. I don't think I could have closed the show off any better myself. As Africans, we need to focus on implementation and get beyond just the ideation of what we're bringing to the table. And that's where we leave it for today. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. A very big thank you to my guest, Robin Martinez, Senior Manager at Dalva Global Development Advisors, Mabutom Tembu, who is the founder and the chairman of the Youth Managers Foundation, and Gandhi Bai. She's a director at the Sandy Zinia Foundation. For you at home, remember if you would like uh, to contribute to the topics of Invest Africa. The hashtag is Invest Africa. Follow me at CNBC Africa and of course at The Real Nausea. Until next time, from myself and the team, it's goodbye.